In this film, we're going to focus on a very complicated idea, that of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin. And I thought it might be best to use this artwork by Jacopo Robusti to do that. This artist is perhaps better known as Tintoretto. That really sweet nickname comes from the profession of his father. He was a tintore, or a cloth dyer. So Tintoretto is the little dyer. This is an artist who was working in Venice, and he was probably painting this at around the age of 50. It was clearly painted as an altarpiece, but we don't know which church it was intended for. You can see we have the Virgin and Child at the top, and we have two evangelists or gospel writers um, at the bottom left and right. At the left, we have St. Mark, the patron saint of Venice, and on the right, we have St. Luke. And I can only imagine he is included here for the way that his gospel in particular focuses on the life of the Virgin. We have quite an unusual representation of the Virgin here. She is often described in this particular way as a Virgin of the Immaculate Conception. And this derives back from a biblical text from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, in which a woman is described as clothed with the sun, crowned with a crown of 12 stars and with a moon at her feet. And that's precisely what we're seeing in this altarpiece. You're absolutely right. That chapter in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, is a description of a highly charged visionary drama in heaven in which there is a woman who's initially pregnant and then gives birth and a dragon who pursues her and her child and she's protected from the dragon. And so Christian readers of this text started to associate the woman in the story with Mary and the dragon with evil and particularly sin um, and saw her as having been preserved, if you like, from the effects of that wickedness. We talked in our last film about how, from a Protestant point of view, that was a problematic idea that all, actually all humans are touched by sin, even Mary. But progressively in the Roman Catholic tradition, it was believed that she was preserved from sin even at the point of her conception, hence the name of that teaching, the Immaculate Conception. And that meant that the union of her parents, Joachim and Anna, produced her without the usual effects of sin. The church had taught that ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the act of procreation or sex was tainted in some way by selfishness and that this was passed down throughout the human race. But Mary is like a little piece of that fallen creation who's exempted from that taint of sin. She's a unique part of the creation who's set apart. So here we're seeing a vision of Mary in her sinlessness. And one of the particular aspects of that, that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is keen to preserve uh, and to pass on, is the idea that that sinlessness is radical. It goes, as it were, all the way to the roots, which is what radical means, literally. And that, of course, makes her completely appropriate as a vessel for bearing the Christ child. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it was felt to be very important to ensure that uh, she was free of sin, so that she would be a suitable vessel. And we've noted that she's been described as the Ark of the Covenant, also a very holy vessel for something even more holy within it. I think as we think about how this might speak to us today, we can perhaps celebrate here the idea of Mary as a sort of example of what it means to be for creation, to be as if it had never sinned. We're given, if you like, a little glimpse of a little piece of creation um, free of sin and encouraged to imagine how all creation will once again be welcomed back into that condition. The bonds of sin, as it were, will be loosed and shed and will once again be able to utter that resounding yes to God's gifts that Mary uttered when she said yes in the moment when she agreed to be the mother of this very special child. And I think that, that, that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is in a way saying that it's not just that somehow, suddenly out of the blue, the Holy Spirit descended on her at that moment of the Annunciation, but in a sense she had already been prepared. The Holy Spirit had been at work in her throughout her life, and that in some sense she was ready and waiting for this, for this moment, for this yes.